Vamos a dar comienzo al panel K, denominado Derechos Fundamentales. A todos los participantes le rogamos que por favor apaguen sus teléfonos celulares. Vamos a contextualizar un poco este panel de Derechos Fundamentales, estableciendo que la protección de los datos personales, entendida como derecho fundamental autónomo, ha pasado a ser un pilar indiscutido en toda sociedad justa y democrática. El esfuerzo por trazar puentes de adaptación entre las tecnologías de la información y este derecho continúa provocando la reflexión de los expertos. Simultáneo con ello, se observa la necesidad de armonizar el conjunto de derechos y libertades fundamentales más presentes y actuantes en la sociedad de la información, los que no siempre guardan un relacionamiento sencillo y sin obstáculos entre sí, así como con la propia privacidad. En un mundo donde el uso de la network se expande sin cesar, la transparencia de los asuntos públicos, la libertad de expresión y el derecho al olvido integran un conjunto de temas siempre pródigo en desafíos y exigencias de atención especializada. Tengo así el gusto de presentarles a los integrantes de este panel, que estará precisamente integrado por el señor Atis Arempa, profesor de Derecho e Informática en la Universidad de Laponia, el señor Giuseppe Bucia, secretario general de la Autoridad Italiana de Protección de Datos, la señora Deborah Harley, asesora independiente en políticas de información y comunicación. Y el señor Jörg Polakiewicz, jefe de política de derechos humanos y departamento de desarrollo del Consejo de Europa. A su vez, este panel estará dirigido por el señor Marcelo Bausá, miembro del Instituto de Derecho Informático de la Universidad de la República y asesor letrado de AGESIC en la posición de moderador. Buenos días a todos, sean bienvenidos en nuestro país con las condiciones climáticas también mejorando y haciendo mías también las palabras de nuestro director de que puedan aprovechar los visitantes extranjeros eh, esta hermosa ciudad. Hoy vamos a hablar en este panel de protección de datos personales en tanto derecho fundamental. Eh, vamos a tener distinguidos expertos que me flanquean y realmente eh, yo quisiera simplemente dejar algunas menciones o algunas reflexiones introductorias para luego inmediatamente pasarle la palabra a ellos y también tener tiempo para el debate posterior. Eh, los derechos fundamentales, también denominados derechos humanos, son una de esas eh, dimensiones del orden social y jurídico que verdaderamente constituyen un centro de gravedad. Es interesante esta, esta aproximación porque el centro de gravedad, el de la Tierra, por ejemplo, cuando se mueve, eh, cambia todo el edificio, cambia todo el sistema. De manera que eh, estos derechos eh, considerados fundamentales por su alto valor ético eh, necesariamente están reconocidos, protegidos por los tratados internacionales, por las cartas constitucionales de los estados democráticos, que no solamente se dedican a formularlos o a declararlos, sino que también prevén las garantías, las fórmulas apropiadas para el reclamo de la vigencia y respeto de los derechos. Dentro de este marco general se mueve entonces, y está ubicado, el derecho fundamental que aparece bajo el nombre del derecho a la protección de datos personales en formas o en épocas relativamente recientes. En pocos años, este nuevo derecho se ha ido destacando progresivamente, de modo autónomo, respecto de otros derechos fundamentales afines, con los cuales se los asociara en el peligro evolutivo, el derecho a la intimidad, el derecho a la privacidad, derechos con los que generalmente, pero no siempre, entra en vinculación y servicio. Es importante entonces detenerse en la reflexión sobre la importancia de la protección de datos como derecho fundamental. En última instancia, significa poner foco en el principio y el fin de todo el ropaje regulatorio del sistema jurídico de la protección de los datos personales. Nos permite conocer mejor, desde sus cimientos, sin perder el norte, la totalidad de un sistema normativo que ya es profuso, que ya es complejo, que ya está invadido o, o asistido de múltiples intereses diversos y que se ha ido construyendo alrededor de esta protección. Yo no quisiera dejar de recordar entonces 
en esta simple introducción, este carácter moral y ético de todo el sistema de la protección de los datos personales, su acendrada apoyatura en principios jurídicos de alcance universal, su porfía y su requerida ponderación o proporcionalidad con otros derechos también fundamentales, y hablamos entonces de elementos que, eh, en este caso, para esta ponderación, como pueden ser la transparencia informativa eh, de carácter público, la gestión estatal eficiente, las cuestiones vinculadas a la seguridad pública. Muchos de estos temas seguramente serán abordados. Recordando eh, entonces, eh, para finalizar esta brevísima introducción, un estudioso alemán, Podlech, ya en 1979 adelantándose al famoso leading case del Tribunal Federal Constitucional sobre la ley del censo, expresaba con mucha precisión, que luego la sentencia del Tribunal Federal eh, lo retomaba, diciendo que un orden social un orden, y un orden jurídico en el que el primero se apoya, donde los ciudadanos ya no pueden saber quién sabe qué, cuándo y en qué situación respecto a su propia persona, no sería compatible. Este autor o al menos esta frase suya, traducida al español, al que tuve acceso con todos esos riesgos de las traducciones, termina con esta expresión de contrario sensu. No sería compatible, dice el Podlech. ¿Compatible con qué? Nos preguntamos. Yo pienso que no lo sería con todos estos criterios éticos y jurídicos de que nos van a hablar los distinguidos expertos que están en esta mesa, a quienes inmediatamente pasaremos a escuchar, y para eso, entonces, le doy la palabra a George Polakiewicz. Okay. Thank you, Marcelo, and... Um Thank you uh, for this introduction, and I'm very honored and happy to be with you uh, here in Punta del Este to share uh, some reflections about uh, data protection and privacy as a fundamental human right. In fact, uh, what my starting point, uh, some of you may remember, my starting point uh, was the closing panel of the International Conference in Mexico City we had last year, because I was struck by a kind of uh, geographical, maybe legal <laughs> tradition, a kind of split. Uh, we had a final, pan a final closing panel with speakers from North America on the one hand and Europe on the other, mainly. And uh, to simplify a bit, on the one hand, uh, we heard a lot about uh, skepticism that there can be general universal standards uh, on in this field, uh, human rights standards, and stressing, on the other hand, uh, simply the need for interoperability between different uh, regional approaches. And on the other hand, you had the European side who very much stressed the importance of uh, a human rights-based approach for, for the whole issue of data protection. So my question that I posed to myself was to see what is the sort of the landscape today. Is it really possible to speak of, uh, of uh, generally recognized universal human rights based principles in this field? And um, coming from the Council of Europe, I, I, I start uh, or I will focus a bit, but just as a starting point on the case law of the European Court of Human Rights. Not because I think that the whole world should follow this court, but simply because it is a court that has delivered numerous judgments, uh, many more than any other uh, international human rights court on the subject. And I leave it to others uh, who will speak then also about the developments in the European Union. Um, because as you know, the f data protection and privacy are guaranteed human rights uh, not only under the European Convention, but of course also under the International Covenant of Political and Civil Rights. Uh, and they are recognized in numerous constitutions uh, and as well as, of course, the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights. And 
the main, uh, on this slide, you see sort of some of the main uh, practical implications of what follows from the basic assumption, the starting point of the court's case law. Probably all of you are experts. I don't have to go, to, to go very much into details. Uh, the court held from the very beginning that the mere storing by a public uh, authority of information relating to an individual's private life amounts to an interference within the meaning of Article 8. And it's even irrelevant whether this uh, information is then used. Uh, it's already the simple storing of such information is an interference which in principle requires a legal basis. And any interference in this field, of course, is subject to a proportionality test. And uh, the court developed then quite a number of principles. Uh, the main ones you see on the slide, even public information can be protected. Uh, but I think most important are the last two ones. Uh, the fact what uh, we call in the European case law the principle of positive obligations uh, that the state has, state has required to create an appropriate regulatory framework which must include both legislation and enforcement capacity to ensure effective protection. And this not only vis-a-vis -vis state authorities, but also vis-a-vis -vis private actors. But I come to this in a minute. The, and the other very important uh, consequence of the recognition of privacy and data protection as a fundamental right so, of course, the principle that there must be accessible and effective remedies uh, for violations of this right. And there it's very interesting is a very recent European study on redress mechanisms in the area of data protection has concluded that also in Europe uh, it's, we are not uh, perfect, the situation is not ideal. In fact, this study concludes uh, or found that victims of data protection breaches appear to have been reluctant to seek redress in court due to formalities, costs, delays and uncertainties, but also because of a general tendency to restrict the possibility of seeking compensation for violation of data protection rights, which are very often also due to strict procedural and evidence-related requirements. So despite the fact that you have uh, that guaranteed in the convention and in men practically all the constitution, there are still many uh, things to, to improve in the area of uh, effective redress for violations. And then, uh, of course, very important in this field, and I think there we come to an area where already regional differences are more important what uh, the question of uh, third party applicability or the question to what extent non-state actors, private corporations have to respect uh, these rights and what is the role of uh, the state authorities because human rights norms as well as fundamental rights on the constitution of course in the traditional sense were always state centered, the concerned relationship between the citizen and the state but uh, under the European Convention, the court has developed a whole uh, case law about positive obligations. And in fact, that so that the state uh, has to provide this effective framework of both legislation and enforcement capacity to provide protection. And this, I think, is something that uh, is probably not unique to Europe, but it has been always, it's much more stressed in Europe than in other jurisdictions. And uh, the, but it is, what is interesting is that in the area of data protection, this idea has from the very beginning been very prominent, the concern that uh, you must provide also protection for interferences by private actors. And Convention 108, already more than 30 years ago, was based on the idea that it, its principles apply to the public as well as the, the private sector. And this was then, of course, taken up also by the directive. And why is this so? The explanatory report makes it clear because already then, 30 years ago, it was said and stated that most traffic, most data traffic occurs in the private sector. 
And uh, this has not changed during the last 30 years. I think we have heard many interventions over the last days that show how much data is used and processed uh, by private companies, in particular nowadays through the internet. And in fact, we come to the paradox, so if you want, or the, 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 the situation that private companies like Google, not to name them, they can now, they have all the technical capabilities and they do in fact collect and analyze in real time traffic data of millions of internet users and make them available for commercial purposes, while at the same time a similar uh, collection and use by public authorities would probably be prohibited in many countries of the world. And of course, that's not to say that this is uh, already a violation of human rights. I think it cannot be a violation because human rights are only addressed to states. But states, as I say, have an obligation under human rights law to create a framework that provides safeguards against abuse and provides protection against possible abuse and misuse of such data. Of course, they have, in this sense, to strike a balance between competing rights, because, of course, also private companies can claim that they exercise rights of property rights, of free, co free commerce rights. So there, the legislator, in fact, has to take an important role in balancing different rights. Now my question, is all this too global, is all this too European for the global marketplace? And in the sh short time allotted to me, I will not be, I cannot give an overview, but I think we have quite many signs that this emerging, there is an emerging consensus on these basic principles. And I just cite some of the recent case law I mean, Latin America is very close to the European thinking. We will hear more about it. In the United States, you have a very strong Fourth Amendment uh, protection, but there is a big difference. The idea that the state has a positive obligation to protect against interferences by private actors is not at all developed. And in the absence of a general legislation framework, the now proposed Obama Privacy Bill of Rights is not yet reality. It is perfectly possible in the US, for example, for wireless or smartphone companies, they, they are not prohibited from disclosing to third parties a detailed record of their customers' traffic data. And there's also no law that currently prevents in the US a web browser from sharing an individual's browsing history with its business partners or a net social network from taking the photos posted online to share with friends and using them to generate a precise and unique personal profile. And of course, situation is similar in Asian countries. Some even say Asian values are not so much uh, open to, uh, to Western human rights, but I would not be so pessimistic. I think human rights have been articulated no less often in Asia than in Europe. And courts also in that region use increasingly the notions of ne necessity and proportionality. And one example is the South Korean Supreme Court's decision on the internet real name policy, which they held unconstitutional. So uh, just very briefly to mention, and I will make available the, in the text more detailed information on that, the Convention 108 was 30 years ago created precisely to secure respect for the right of privacy and it was very deliberate that the word privacy was used and not private life, the term that the European Convention had, because already at that time it was thought that this instrument should be a truly international instrument. And in the modernization process, in fact, uh, we have uh, come up now with proposals at the state, they of course not yet adopted, but to introduce also the notions of human dignity and the right to control one's own person, own data and the use made of such data into the preamble as objectives of this convention. And we have strengthened the provisions on sensitive data, uh, including in particular also genetic data and biometric information on transparency, impact assessment and privacy by design. All this taking up also notions developed by APEC uh, privacy rules, 
precisely to make the instrument more modern and taking into account experience in other countries. And of course, one very difficult part, but I think others will go more into details of this, is that any regulation of data protection has to cr balance different, sometimes competing rights like uh, privacy, data protection, freedom of expression, freedom to provide services, uh, right to property, workers' rights, freedom of association. In Germany, we have the idea of uh, practical reconciliation, practical concordance. These rights have to be weighed against each other. No right is superior of the other, and they have to be brought into balance. But this is a delicate process, and this is what makes also, for example, now the work on the EU framework so difficult and sometimes controversial, because it's basically a legislation which has to balance uh, fundamental rights. And in just to give one example from our modernization process, these questions came up in two fields, uh, just uh, at least. One is the famous ex the press privilege, the new draft uh, for the convention will contain explicitly this uh, exception that uh, some or most uh, some of the principles of the convention can be restricted in, in order to protect freedom of expression, including also in particular the regulations on transborder data flows. On the other hand, Having concerns about freedom of expression, the drafters uh, of the con these amendments, which is the other parties to the, the current parties to the convention, did not include the right to be forgotten, what figures so prominently in the EU framework, because in our context it was felt that this right is already, it should not, it's really an overstatement, and it is something which is already protected by the by the right to rectify, to erase data, and the right of opposition, and the limits for the storage of data. This brings me to the conclusion. I think uh, what this, of course, I'm very happy to discuss more in detail. I think we have, we see, I would be optimistic uh, to cite Antonio Gramsci. I think we should unite the pessimism of the intellect with the optimism of the will. There is, a, I think there are emerging contours of a, a global right to data protection, maybe not of the right to privacy understood as the right to be alone. I think this is very differently understood in Dakar or Shanghai or Strasbourg or, or Montevideo. But the basic notions, the right to control one's own data, which eventually is based also on the notions of human dignity, I think on that one, I see, I'm, I would be quite confident to say that there is an emerging consensus and one can build a framework on this understanding. Thank you. Muchas gracias, George, por este marco que nos has dado, este, que nos permite realmente introducirnos a fondo en los temas de la protección de datos este, bajo el foco de considerarlo un derecho fundamental, toda esta revisión jurisprudencial y estas innovaciones del convenio 108 que realmente pienso que darán lugar a, a que puedas ampliar también en el debate posterior eh, estos conceptos. Le vamos a dar la palabra ahora a nuestro segundo disertante, Giuseppe Buccia. Gracias. Muchas gracias. Yo quiero agradecer el, uh, la, la Unidad Reguladora de Control de Datos por esa invitación y Marcelo uh, que, um, por la organización de, de todo eso. Uh, yo voy a intentar hablar inglés por, eh, y me excuso en adelante porque mi inglés no es muy, muy bueno. Uh, uh, I, uh, Jorge uh, began speaking about uh, uh, or spoke about Convention 108. I will start from uh, EU recognition of right of personal data protection as a fundamental right. And uh, uh, secondly, I will, um, I will uh, 
point out that there are uh, at least two important um, challenges, problems that arise after a formal recognition of uh, a fundamental right like that. Uh, the first is the need uh, to balance uh, this, uh, the, the, the right to protect personal data uh, to other uh, uh, fundamental rights. And the second is the new challenges of the Internet. And uh, uh, in this framework, I will try to uh, point out the, the, import, the, the fundamental role that in this field is, uh, um, um, has the Data Protection Authority and the need of a, a, a global um, global um, um, uh, recognition of the right as a basis to, to be an effective concrete recognition. Uh, as you know, the uh, EU uh, Charter of Fundamental Rights, the one that was uh, approved in Nice in 2000 and then became part of the treaty in, uh, with the Lisbon Treaty, uh, consider, uh, consolidated uh, all the right arising, arising from the constitutional tradition of member states uh, and from the European Court of Justice into uh, a single instrument. And, uh, they put, uh, and the chart, uh, as you know, um, set out both the right of the um, protection of private and family life and in Article 7, and the right to protection of personal, uh, of personal data in Article 8. Uh, reaffirming also the importance of the supervisory authority. Uh, nowadays, so there is no question that in Europe, the right to privacy, private life, and personal data protection are are considered as fundamental rights, uh, as they are function to the protection of individual, the right to self-demonstration and the freedom of choice. And this has two consequences, two main consequences. Not only that the state protection of personal data may not be derogated from member states' legislation, but, and this is the most important part, uh, also, uh, it may not derogate it from EU sources of law that, they, uh, that are, of course, subject to the treaty. Um, and this is the real, veritable innovation of the uh, formal recognition and in the treaty. Uh, but when there is a formal recognition, as uh, we said, uh, we, have, uh, we have to ask to if there is a veritable protection. Uh, this is only the first step to a long way. Uh, the first problem is that um, uh, when, uh, 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 when there is affirmation that uh, you have a fundamental right, uh, another fundamental right may be in conflict with it. And so uh, it should, um, should be pointed out that uh, affirming a fundamental right does not and should not entail make this an absolute right. As uh, Peter Heberl, a German scholar, a constitutional scholar, a co um, scholar in constitutional law, said, uh, competing constitutional values are not arranged hier uh, hierarchically and thus mutually exclusive. In fact, they are coordinated so that they condition one another. That means that when there, are, uh, there is the need to balance some fundamental rights, uh, uh, after the balance, uh, one in certain way, they transform themselves. They are not the same uh, as considered at alone. Uh, so, uh, the European legal order is a framework of value in which the individual values are not arranged according a predefined hierarchical sequence. And for this reason, wherever an equally fundamental value comes to be in conflict, 
One has to balance them in order to allow this value to interact in, our, in accordance with balance standards and should vary, and this balance should vary in specific circumstances. This means that there is a need of evaluation on a case-by-case case, uh, basis. And this is uh, a big uh, space for uh, the uh, Data Protection Authority. Um, from Data Protection, I, I will uh, there are, as Marcelo said before, many examples of this regard. I will find, uh, I will point out uh, the, uh, the case of freedom of expression, because from uh, uh, the data protection point of view, uh, one of the most evident examples uh, that we have is the conflict that may arise between the right to protect one own personal information and the right of third party to freely express themselves and inform others. Uh, the right to know the freedom to impart information and transparency are uh, essential feature in a democratic society, um, uh, so we, uh, is a good example at uh, this regard. So the first, uh, the first uh, step in the framework is the need to balance. The second is uh, the, the challenge that all the, uh, all the um, fundamental right, but especially uh, the, fundament the, the right to protect uh, the, the, the data protection uh, is with uh, uh, internet. As we know, um, in uh, remaining in the example of freedom of information, uh, the first uh, character, character that uh, uh, arises is um, the, um, the openness of the, of the web. Freedom of information should no longer be regarded as the only domain of journalists or media professionals. Uh, nowadays, anyone can disseminate opinion and news through the web without being a professional journalist. Secondly, there is the amount of information being disseminated. There is no limit uh, in, uh, in the, the, the data that, 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 that is possible to disseminate on the Internet. Third, there is the time which the information can remain on the net. Books, newspapers, printed publication are subject to physical destruction and an item in of information that is posted on the net can remain forever. But there is the fourth, the most important consequence of uh, the, the new technologies and the internet uh, that challenge uh, this right is that geographical borders do not exist in the internet uh, and uh, posting the news in the net is uh, uh, on the net is the same as disseminating it worldwide, and this is the fourth more important uh, conference. In uh, this, is the most important point that uh, I uh, um, can, uh, would like to stress. So, in this uh, framework, uh, we have to. Uh, to see which is the role of data protection authority. I would like to uh, point out uh, an example. Uh, the archives that are available online. Um, uh, the way in which operate uh, has resulted into a major change compared to traditional archive of newspapers. Also local and little newspaper. Millions of users worldwide can perform name searches not only for historical research or journalistic purpose, but also uh, of, because of curiosity. Using search engines, it is possible to retrieve news dating back to the remote past for which no subsequent record was made for possible changes such as the given person was found not guilty of the crime for which he had been tried. A and in this field, the, data protection, uh, the Italian Data Protection Authority and then the Berlin Group is working on that, 
required to take measure uh, for the appropriate indexing of new via external ser uh, searching engine. That means that uh, any, uh, any website of, uh, of newspaper has the possibility to organize itself uh, to not allow to the uh, search engines to find uh, how from outside uh, the information. Another example, only to, 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 to say that uh, the time is going on and I will be uh, very quickly, uh, uh, that I want uh, to point out is the specific code of practice that the Italian legislation uh, provides. This, uh, Code of Ethics uh, uh, are, uh, um, are proposed by the, uh, by the Data Protection Authority and the rule of Code of Ethics are the benchmark to evaluate and the lawfulness of processing personal data in the journalist sector as well in reported news and information. Furthermore, the journalist code of ethics is a very peculiar instance of cell regulations since its, its rules are also binding on the entities that have not taken part in approving, in approving the code. The code is subject to the, to the supervision by the Italian DPA, which may also require additional measure to be taken in order to protect the data subject. The code is an instance of participated self-regulation since the rules in question are shared or even set for uh, by supervisory authority. In short, is we can say that is not uh, uh, self-regulation itself, but is a, a, a form of co-regulation because the DPA works with the, uh, with the uh, journalist and the uh, rules are binding for the actors. The second, the second point, uh, uh, the second question that I said uh, arise from the internet is there are no boundaries as I said and uh, so the question is how is possible to protect the right in internet? Uh, the problem is fact is that uh, any legislation may be bypassed rather easily by using servers located in countries with less restrictive regulation. So no protection um, uh, can be afforded. And which is the answer? Briefly, uh, in front of this change, the only answer is that any regularity, regulatory approach uh, that is aimed to uh, um, uh, increase effectiveness has to involve as many uh, states as is possible. So I will, uh, will point out two points, uh, concluding saying that uh, as there are many fundamental rights, we have to balance uh, and the, this activity has to be done on case-by-case -case basis, as I said, I try to sum up. Our society is evolving very quickly. Technology uh, is uh, uh, developed continuously. Uh, societal demand changes a quick pace. Uh, and parliaments many times are not, have not the possibility to react promptly to these changes. So to ensure that fundamental rights will keep effective, there is a need of independent DPA, which has to evaluate case by, on case-by-case case ca basis and react promptly on respect to big and little changes. The DPA uh, are not only organs that have to control the correct application of fundamental rights, but they are also necessary part of fundamental rights themselves. They are, they are a, a part of the right and, uh, and not only an organ to control it uh, from this point of view. And the other, on the other hand, uh, the, um, the challenge of the net uh, we uh, 
um, for, for the reason that they say the main ca uh, car character to safeguard the effectiveness of fundamental right is that they are shared almost, almost by all the countries around the world. There are already significant examples of this. Uh, we, we, uh, we know the, the Declaration of Madrid in 2009. And so we need an international debate involving the most different experience, only through dialogue and open mind and open mind exchange of view and opinion we can contribute jointly to bringing about society that are really modern and democratic. And so recognizing, respecting and making the most mu mutual difference. In a global as well a globalized world, recognize a right is only workable if this right is protected outside the territory when it was set forth. In forums like today's and in debate like uh, the one that we are doing in these days, uh, we can find the ground for planting the seeds that can make shared discussion grow, looking for values as shared across countries. In this way, and only in this way, right strongly joined again their nature of universal right, human right, the mean right to be applied for all the human, for all the men worldwide. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, Giuseppe. Es indudablemente este tema este tema es un tema, digamos, de muchas facetas, se están tocando muchas de ellas. Destaco la necesidad entonces de ampliar, de amplificar, digamos, la legislación eh, mundial, digamos, en materia de protección de datos personales y al mismo tiempo el rol de las autoridades eh, de protección de datos personales. Eh, le vamos a pedir entonces a los restantes panelistas que podamos manejar el tiempo, queremos dar oportunidad también al auditorio para que intervenga, de todas maneras este, no, no se tome esto como una constricción, pero sí a los efectos de poder avanzar, le vamos a dar entonces la palabra a eh, Débora Harley, que nos va a dejar eh, su exposición. Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, thank you first of all to the Data Protection Authority of Uruguay. Thanks also to the government of Uruguay for assembling us all here, and thank you to our moderator, Marcelo, for organizing all of us today. Um, I want to speak with you briefly, uh, and you won't be surprised about what, about uh, two global issues. Those issues are human rights and the information society. And I'm going to talk about human rights, including privacy, and the information society. Pardon. I, thank you. The task is uh, simple, actually. We tend to overcomplicate it. Our task, and this includes everyone in this room and in this uh, convention, is to embed the information society firmly in the ground of human rights. So with regard to the human rights canon, as I call it, uh, there's quite a range of human rights, but they are um, universal. I just want to remind you, they are indivisible, they are interdependent, and they are interrelated. So all human rights, including privacy, share that status. Uh, it was affirmed in the Vienna Declaration not too many years ago um, that human rights and fundamental freedoms are the birthright of every person on earth. And in addition, it was affirmed that it is the responsibility to uh, secure to each individual their human rights. Not only is it the responsibility of government, but there is an affirmative duty placed on every single other individual on the planet. So we all have this common responsibility that it is our affirmative and active duty each day to bring about. Um, there's been a bit, I want to comment on two things before I get into the heart of what I want to say. There's been a bit of an expansion of the discussion of rights. And certainly we are, already have a lot of work to do to improve and increase and implement and enforce the human rights that already exist and that have been adopted. Uh, this expansion of rights takes many forms. It's a popular thing to talk about now, rights to this and rights to that. I mean, one of the most recent ones was the right to be forgotten. And so there, I con I'm concerned about this because this proliferation of rights 
uh, takes attention away from securing um, the negotiated and agreed rights that we already have and need to implement and enforce. In addition, there has been, over recent decades, a lot of talk about privacy being cultural. Oh, privacy is such a cultural concept. There's no way we can legislate it or people feel so differently about it and so forth that we can't really get our arms around privacy, we can't protect it, and we can't do much of anything about it. And that I want to settle now. That is absolutely not the case. The privacy, rights to privacy are in the Human Rights Conventions. The Human Rights Conventions have been adopted by more than 150 countries around the world. So the Human Rights Conventions are one of the most successful areas of law in the entire history of humanity. It is an example of success, an example of uh, uniformity, an example of agreement. And the Human Rights Conventions do include quite explicitly, as my colleagues have already mentioned, the right to privacy. So I hope we can lay to rest this notion that privacy is so culturally bound that there's no way we can legislate about it, even nationally or regionally or uh, globally. And that certainly is not the case and has not been the case. Um, there's another very successful area of law, again, one of the most successful areas of law in the history of humanity, and that's privacy law. And as we've heard repeatedly during the course of this conference, at this point, 90 countries have adopted uh, privacy legislation. So that's a very successful, so we have trends that are very encouraging. Uh, certainly in Latin America, and this conference being here is the timing is uh, perfect. Uh, certainly through the Ibero-America activities and otherwise, we've heard about Colombia's new law, the laws here, other new laws being adopted, uh, bills, draft legislation in Brazil. So clearly the trend is uh, we are on the move toward increasing privacy and human rights, not only in Latin America, but around the world. So this provides us, as I said, with a very firm foundation of commonality and agreement in which to embed uh, the information society. And I'd like to talk for a moment about the information society. I, I actually don't like to use that term. The term I use is the ubiquitous information environment. And the ubiquitous information environment has five characteristics. The five characteristics are, its, and I'll speak about e just very briefly about each of them, but some of the implications for privacy. So the five characteristics of the ubiquitous information environment are, first of all, embeddedness. The second one is the ubiquity of it. The third is its unboundedness. The fourth is its decentralization. And the fifth is its complexity. So I am very much in favor of technological innovation and science and technology, and I work a lot in the science and technology policy area, and it's important to remember, for those of us in the privacy community, that the fruits of science and technology offer the world its best hope for the future. So this is a very important domain that we need to encourage and to allow to flourish. Um, but in the ubiquitous information environment, again, there's a lot of discussion about social media, I think it's much too narrow to think about social media and social com media concerns. We need to think about all media because computing and communication activity, in addition to what we have now, very soon will be happening everywhere, not only in solids, but in liquids. This will be a computing device and in the air we breathe. And we will be breathing that air and in gather gases and we'll be breathing those computing and communication devices in and out of our bodies you know, throughout the day. Some will reside there, some will leave us and go elsewhere. So we need, um, the other day in the public voice meeting, um, Bruce Schneier mentioned 3D printers very briefly. I think that people didn't really catch what he was saying, but essentially again using new materials and nanomaterials, in addition to sort of printing a document at home, you'll be able to print objects that you need. You know, to, to manufacture them right at home, which will have very significant uh, economic effects that we're not here to talk about today. But the ability, our ability to, the humans have sought throughout their history, throughout the species history, to control the environment and transform matter, right? Fire is the classic example. So again, we are able now to do that increasingly at a molecular level and with both biological and inorganic elements. And so we're going to see computing communications devices throughout all of that, seamlessly um, embedded through that. So we need to think about that uh, 
framework, that structure, and how we provide privacy and human rights protection within it. Now, this is not so foreign, really, to you, because the blurring of the lines between what's human and what's not, we already are very accustomed to that, actually. Everybody has uh, intestinal bacteria, and it's not exactly part of your human body, but I bet you consider it to be part of your human body. It resides within you and so forth. You're really kind of unaware of it. Um, so we already have this concept of, of things that are in and around the human that are not actually human per se. So this uh, will be uh, done increasingly with technological devices. With regard to privacy, there are um, two issues uh, that underlie, for me, the entire discussion of privacy and data protection. And they are the following. The locus of control of the information who or what controls the particular information, and then the notion of proportionality. Is the measure or the solution, either is the measure to be adopted for positive purpose, or is the solution to be put in place to address some perceived harm, is it in any way proportional to the matter you're trying to solve? And you know, many times these solutions tend to be wildly disproportionate, and that's where the trouble begins. Privacy to me really encompasses the notions of autonomy and self-determination, which takes us very quickly to thinking about dignity, liberty, and equality. Again, I want to underscore that privacy and the human rights conventions are about the protection of individual human beings and each human being. Certainly, it's already been mentioned by Giuseppe and others that um, privacy coexists with other human rights, and those include, you mentioned uh, freedom of expression. Uh, one that was discussed at this conference yesterday was the right to information, to governmental information. Um, certainly, there are other rights that privacy coexists with, the freedom of movement, freedom, which is geolocation, obviously, uh, is immediately implicated, uh, freedom of asso association, very important for many purposes, but for political speech, for activities, and so forth. Um, so there are, an, there's a very important work to be done in making sure that we keep all of this in good balance. Two things I want to mention in particular with regard to privacy when we think about this uh, growing ubiquitous information environment are awareness and identification. I want to talk about both of those briefly. Um, Increasingly, as you can tell from the small examples I gave and from your own experience, um, information is being collected about us of which we are unaware. And there are many examples of this. So you may fill out a form and you know, consciously, actively give information, but there may be times where information about you is being collected without Without, you know, beyond your conscious knowledge. So again, if you have a medical device that's in you and that is wirelessly transmitting to the hospital or the doctor, you may not be you know, aware of that transmission. You may not be receiving the information yourself and so forth. There are many examples of this. This is used in shopping when people enter stores, their eye movements are tracked uh, as, you know, to offer them products and discounts. Um, again, most people aren't aware of how their eyes move in space, you know, aren't aware of the particular movements their eyes are making. But at the same time, it's very important to underscore, and we all know this, that a patient unconscious in her hospital bed is entitled to the same level of privacy and data protection as someone fully conscious sitting up in their office. So the fact that there is awareness of the data collection and use is not relevant. And sometimes people try and use that as a reason to be able to take control of the privacy protection from the individual. So one important point I wanted to make. In addition, with regard to identification, um, you know, systems were set up to be largely identifiable. You know, legacies of early computing systems, again, most of you are very aware of that history. That need not be the case. Uh, and we have talk about a um, spectrum of identifiability from complete anonymity to full identifiability. And there are many nodes on that spectrum of identifiability. You could be just a member of the group, which would allow you into your gym, for example. They really don't need it to know it's you coming to work out. There could be pseudonymity. There are many, many nodes in between anonymity and identifiability. And I feel that we have insufficiently explored that space, again, as information is more ubiquitous, 
much of it need not be identifiable, and we need to really look at the entire spectrum of identifiability. Um, some researchers use the concept of what they call a one-way ratchet, which is as you add identifiability, it's very hard to strip off identifiability once it's in the system. And we deal with, you know, anonymization now and all of, you know, twist ourselves in all directions to try and deal with this. But if we were to think more carefully and implement more carefully identifiability spectrum, you know, as we move through different kinds of information collection, it would assist us and not have to do these retrofits of anonymization, which has its very big problems and so forth. Um, I just want to mention that um, yesterday uh, there was a discussion about a do not track. So now um, Microsoft has decided they will enable that do not track. They could have enabled it 10 years ago or 15 years ago. The only point I want to make here, because I've already got a green card and I definitely do not want a red card. So uh, you're a better football player than I am, I'm sure, and he got a red card, so I'm going to uh, move quickly. But the only point I want to make about do not track is that uh, the tech, the, we don't have to be bound by technological determinism. There is a complete flexibility of this technology and an ability to demand um, better from the technology. Uh, finally, I want to mention briefly that you know often these fixes, these information fixes, are visited first and early on vulnerable populations or populations with diminished rights, and that can include prisoners, uh, children, the elderly, people who are ill. Um, indigenous populations, women, right, others, ethnic minorities. So again, we need to be vigilant on their behalf um, so that they are not, I mean, good examples of this, right in this conference there was a discussion yesterday about how India is taking biometrics of all its citizens, you know, unaware of the implications. Um, so we need to be very aware of this. I mean, Gandhi himself said that the measure of a civilized society is the way that it treats its minorities. What's the way forward here? Um, privacy, I think, is a pretty successful regime, actually. I think we should get out a green flag and wave it there. I think we're doing pretty well. Uh, we have an extreme amount of knowledge at this point. There's a lot of sunk uh, capital in what we know about privacy, both intellectually and um, in implementing it. We have a great deal of expertise represented here um, as well. And so that is the tip of the spear. There's a clear mandate now from the public, from individuals, that they want more privacy. We saw yesterday the polls you know, from countries around the world in the 80% range saying they want better privacy protection. So my final challenge to you is many of us will meet in some other country in one year's time for this meeting. I, um, as those who work with me know, I love execution. Let's execute. Let's get it done. Let's not just talk about it. So I challenge each of you in, the, in one year's time to have done three concrete things to improve the privacy and human rights of individuals around the world. Thank you so much. Muchas gracias, Débora. Este mensaje final muy alentador y combativo que nos pone a todos en alerta para seguir... Eh, eh, propugnando, digamos, la defensa de la protección de datos como derecho fundamental. Le vamos a dar la palabra entonces a nuestro último panelista, eh, ya un poco eh, sobre, no sobre la hora, pero sí con los minutos para que se haga la exposición como estaba programada. No sabemos en este momento si podremos tener mucha posibilidad de debate posterior, el tiempo siempre es tirano. Adelante a ti. Bueno, well, estimado Marcelo, Ladies and gentlemen, we try to open it. So it's easy to be the last speaker. Why? The others, my colleagues, they have already told almost everything which is important. <laughs> so, however, I would like to add something or to add some chaos in this discussion. This uh, photo is symbolic. You can see the two uh, big passenger ferries going from Finland to Sweden. Every single day, every single evening, they are going to Stockholm. But this photo is almost impossible because following the timetable, the first one should have been here already half an hour ago. But now the smaller one is having some kind of competition. They are at the same time 
in the same place. How is it possible? So I don't think about uh, Paris anymore. I think about laws and rights. So it's very typical that we have uh, in the same place, in the same combination, we have different kind of fundamental rights. And let's look at that recital 72. It's the recital 72 of the personal data directive. It's the last recital. It's the result of Finland and Sweden. They wanted to add that result. They were new members of EU, not participating in that uh, drafting process, but during the last minute, they added this one. And they have been occurring a lot of problems. Because in many situations, for example, the public sector, and especially the public sector, has used this recital against our right to personal data protection. We can find in Finland and in Sweden also a lot of cases where the law court has not used personal data legislation, thinking that openness is something which is more important, openness and transparency. And this is the Nordic uh, historical point of view. We have been very proud of our openness politics. So, in the same case, openness and personal data protection. Today, it is a daily situation, really. I have been, in my teaching, speaking about the double-decker of fundamental rights. We have a lot of fundamental rights, and we should put those together. But how to do it? So one day, uh, openness is upstairs, and data protection downstairs. And next day, it can be opposite. That's a problem. And one of those reasons which we have is that we have very conservative lawyers in daily work everywhere. So when I today discuss a little bit about fundamental rights, so I go from the practical human rights, they are really practical today, to the need of interactive legislation, especially in the field of data protection. And I start with a new Supreme Court case from Finland. It's uh, a case which is uh, written here out. So a prisoner did want to receive compensation because his letter was opened uh, in, in jail against all rules. And the Supreme Court stated that the situation did not fulfill the requirements set out in the Tort Liability Act for damages. But after that, we had to go to look and analyze the human rights and fundamental rights. Why this message? Because in Finland and in all Nordic countries, there has been a tradition that judges are following strictly domestic written law, and only that. Finland was the last one to take into account human rights due to political reasons, because Finland was not a member of the Council of Europe before the beginning of 90s. Russia is our neighbor, and that was the real reason. And still today, we have those judges who have this traditional legalism first in mind the domestic written law, and if you cannot find the section, so the problem is out of discussion. That's why this new uh, message. So, after this, to the rights of persons with disabilities, we have a new convention, uh, United Nations Convention, and I think that 
only some few of you of uh, this auditorium you have been thinking about the role of that convention uh, in the field of data protection. But however, it's quite important. Today we are not speaking anymore about traditional guardianship. We should speak about supported self-determination with guardianship tools. So who can use and how the personal data of those who are having disabilities? When looking at this convention, the Article 1 is really telling that it's very wide scope there. Older people who are having dementic problems, they do belong under this umbrella. So they have the access, they must have the access to networks. They must have the right to get support. And then who can use their personal data and how? That is a challenging really challenging new problematics. When we were drafting the personal data directive, so we did not remember children. Now in the new draft for the regulation, children are partly taken into account, but not elder people. So human rights are really practical today, everywhere, and in most daily routines which we are having. So, then this data protection and privacy. As the others already have pointed out, we have now two different fundamental rights in Europe. Privacy, right to privacy, and right to the protection of personal data. So what is the result of this new divide? If you are looking at this draft to the regulation, Article 1, you cannot see the concept of privacy. No, it's not there. They are only writing about personal data. Personal data and this regulation protects the fundamental rights and freedoms of natural persons and in particular the right to the protection of personal data. So, that is something really important. Every single time when we are processing personal data, we are processing our fundamental right too. So it's not only a part of privacy, but it's really somehow independent. Of course, personal information usually does belong to the area of privacy, but the scope is much more wide. So, in this new situation, it's interesting to see that it's strengthening of the rights of the individual in the constitutional state and the era of the digital working environment. We no longer think, nor we can, that personal data is only raw material or the stuff of documents. It's something more important but conservative old lawyers don't understand and accept the idea. And then, again from Finland and from European court, so some years ago we had a case where one company was selling our taxation information. It's partly public. They collected it and after that they were selling it. It was possible, for example, by a mobile phone to buy that information. Very good idea if you are late in the evening in the restaurant and you can see one in interesting person. So how rich is he? But it was against the personal data directive. Finland had to change its legislation. We had first the idea that if something is public, so it's really public. But a long part of personal data, it's much more interesting and important. And now, at the end, some important concepts which I have used. 
network society. We are not anymore living in information society. That concept should be belong to history. We are not anymore working in the e-government. That concept does belong or should be belong to history. So information government is something more important. Legal welfare, our rights should be effective as early as possible. By the way, that European court case, it took eight years. And they were, during those eight years, all the time making business with our personal data. And then legal planning. So shortly, network society is really something where we all are depending on networks and digital data systems and we all should have access to those networks and data systems, most of those. So it's something else than that old static uh, document-based information society. This new information government is a government where we as citizens should have interactive connection to public sector and to monitor how our cases are going on in public sector offices. Technology is giving the possibility. In Finland we have already citizens account. Citizens account which is giving this possibility. It's one part of the information government idea. And then, from the rule of law state, we should go to legal welfare state, where really the realization of our fundamental rights through information systems should be possible as early, as early as possible, yet. Yeah. Legal planning. I have seen here the documents where uh, you can find information about privacy by design. As uh, our data ombudsman, Mr. Rejo Arnio, has said, we in Finland, we had privacy by design already 1987 when we got the first uh, Personal Data Act. So we don't use that concept, but the idea is the same. And today, the legal planning of data systems, it's absolutely important. But who would like to cooperate with lawyers? That's the question of IT people very often. So, our education very often is closing the doors. And that's why we are having and witnessing problems later, too late. And then one very, very, very detailed example of what can happen today. So it's from my university, it's from Finnish, all Finnish universities. We have one keyword to different kind of services. One keyword which is the same when using emails, when going to library, when having some, some internet services. That is absolutely against the law, the fundamental rights, we can speak about this double-decker. So violation of, an, of a confidential communication and violation of data protection at the same time. But how to tell it to IT people? I have tried without success. And this idea of interactive legislation, why are we writing, drafting law using only linear text? Especially those daily fundamental rights should be visible by different way in our legislation. So ladies and gentlemen, 2020 we are, or those who are witnessing what is going on, so we can see a new society where citizens do have access to different kind of services 
by a different way than today. Fundamental rights are really practical. I hope so. Thanks. Bien, muchas gracias, Sati. Estos, estas reflexiones muy, eh, bueno, muy nutridas. Yo sé que todos los panelistas se han dejado cosas por decir. Tenemos cinco minutos para que al, intervenga el público, como corresponde. Así que vamos a, a abrir el, el panorama en este momento a alguna pregunta, un par de preguntas, no creo que dé para más, si alguien quiere tener alguna intervención. Aquí, a, a mí dice. Eh, por favor, si, si se identifique. Bueno. Yes. Thank you very much. My name is Paul Gürtler. I'm from Germany. I'm here for a group of data protection professionals. I would like to thank the forum uh, for um, uh, discussing this very important topic, and especially the last speaker who uh, tried to uh, give some answers regarding to the effort to build the adaption bridges between the information technology and the fun fundamental right. In my business life, I'm a data protection officer from Germany, and I also know these discussions with the information security uh, guys, etc. What my opinion is, what would bring us forward is to bring data protection and this fundamental right discussion into the information security world. And the information security world is only focusing on uh, uh, availability, uh, integrity, and so on, but not on data protection. And all companies around the world have huge efforts to make data secure, etc. but nothing in this code is uh, regarding this fundamental right. And uh, what we see here also in the modernization of the EU uh, data protection law is uh, that we have some uh, yeah, laws which says uh, data has to be secure and we leave this important field to information security which is too narrow-minded to protect uh, this. So my question to the, to the panel is how can we achieve uh, or, or to build this gap which is really needed in practice so we have to have some discussion points from a data protection point of view with our uh, partners in IT. In Germany, I can rely on a section which gives more sub, um, let's say, sub principles on data security, like right to assess, like right to um, uh, whatever. But but uh, here, when we have only a general principle, it will not really help in practice. Thank you very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it was 1997 when we, in my institute, we did publish a report in Finland, and it was a report to the Ministry of Finances, which was responsible of information security. And as a result of our short report, only 700 pages, so we said that we should get to Finland the General Information Security Act as soon as possible. And why we started this discussion? So we were drafting the new uh, personal data uh, directive. We were implementing it, drafting the Finnish legislation. And when sitting there in our meetings, we could see that there is not any balance between data protection and information security. So what happened when we published our report? So some big public institutions uh, who were hosting the biggest Finnish databases, they said that don't put uh, legislation to our area. And for example, one of those, two weeks after that opinion, they lost thousands, hundreds of thousands of personal information when uh, the system was crashing down. So they did not have even acceptable IT uh, quality, and they did not have any idea of the role of information security in society. I still have the opinion 
that we should get a general uh, information security act into all uh, countries. In Europe, it has been very difficult to discuss about this problematics because this security is, so people understand it, one part of general security. And that's why European Union is not willing or is not able to make any directive. But those national solutions should be possible and we really do need those. So let me say that this conference, for example, should send a message to all countries. Please try to regulate information security. The domestic regulation already does help. Thanks for this question. Le vamos a dar ahora la palabra a la panelista Débora Hailey, que tiene interés en intervenir. Lo que no saben los panelistas y, la, y el público es que tenemos orden de dejar el salón a las 12.30, estamos pasados. Yo sé que George también querrá hablar, eh, de manera que le vamos a pedir tanto a Débora como a George, en, en ese orden, que sean precisas y, y puntuales y lo más breve posible en, en esta intervención. Serán la las últimas intervenciones de este panel. Gracias. Thank you, Marcelo. Um, thank you for your question, because due to time I had to drop out the, what I was going to say about security of information systems exactly. So, very briefly, I mentioned identifiability and the spectrum of identifiability. One, uh, first of all, privacy is a human right. And in order to protect privacy, you must protect the security of the information systems and the you must secure the information and the information themselves th that is in the systems. So with, uh, with greater identifiability, uh, in addition to raising privacy concerns, which I did discuss, overuse of identifiability may also create security problems. It may lead to large databases that become attractive targets, um, you know, databases of personal identifiers. In fact, we've seen this happen. Um, and so they are targets for identity theft or fraud or so forth. In addition, for the enterprise or the government, it imposes additional burdens on them uh, and costs to try and keep the secure. And it goes again to what I was saying, rather than these retrofits of anonymization and so forth, that we think very carefully about identifiability and you know, where on that identifiability spectrum we need to be with any particular information will help. In addition, very briefly, another great example of this is biometrics. We heard you know, yesterday about the whole um, population of India. There are two unique, supposedly unique biometric identifiers being taken of 1.2 billion people. There's a dirty secret. Biometrics are not unique. Uh, we're creating this gigantic database um, which are, has its own inherent security problems because biometrics are not unique. And then going on beyond that, this very large database that becomes a very juicy fat target for uh, bad actors. Um, and not only in, in uh, India, but in Iraq and other places, we're approaching at this point the collection of biometric, supposedly but not really unique identifiers of about 15% of the people on the planet. That is a gigantic security problem. George. I'm also very grateful for the question, and it's obvious. Uh, I think we cannot expect, uh, for example, business enterprises to read uh, the case law of the European Court or to, <laughs> to go on, on websites. I think the most, probably one of the, where I'm most uh, satisfied with the modernization process of Convention 108 is that they introduced the notion, the obligation of privacy impact assessment. I think if the enterprises, the business world, and the, the private actors have to identify the risks uh, that, are their, that their operations are posing for privacy and that they have to uh, put procedures in place and have to report on this. I think very important is also transparency. I think this is the best way to translate these rather broad principles into the reality. And this is not a matter of law but sim simply of common sense. Uh, a company will only be able to know and show that it respects privacy if it has processes in place and reports on them. 
Bien, muchas gracias a los distinguidos expertos del panel, muchas gracias también al público asistente que también eh, nos consta que está pleno de expertos en el auditorio, lamentamos que no se haya podido concretar más preguntas, seguramente el ámbito distendido de esta conferencia permitirá que cada uno pueda hacer sus inquietudes este, en el momento posteriores de, de esta conferencia. Nos despedimos entonces con el... Aplauso para los panelistas. Gracias.